of Jesus. take a seat. Thank you for joining us today. So awesome to have you here. Hey, if it's one of your first times being around here, we just want you to know this is a safe place for you to experience your next step in your faith. And we are a come as you are community. God wants to meet you right where you're at and he wants to help you take your next step of faith. So glad you're here. An online audience, thank you for tuning in today. So great to have you. Hey, when you came in today, you should have been handed this. This is our life guide. 
like, I just want to draw your attention to that because inside there are several important things, one of which is our connection card. And this is our tool to stay in communication and contact with all of us that join us here on Sundays. And so if you're a guest too, after the service, we'd invite you to go ahead and fill out your contact information and then you can take it out uh, to the new here table. And we have a gift for you out there, just our way of saying thank you for joining us. And you know, we are a church that cares about reaching the next generation, investing in families. And we want to let you know about several of the opportunities coming up. And one is called Married Life Live. And all of us, if we're being honest, can use a tune-up in our marriages. And one thing I found in 14 years of being married is that it takes work take some investment in anything worthwhile in life really does. And so this is an opportunity for you to just get recharged, get invested in, and we would invite you there. It's Friday, April 12th, and it's going to be right here in this space. Also, upcoming is an opportunity for you to get the kids out of the house. Amen on that right? We have a volleyball league that is forming right now. And I'm telling you, this is one of my favorite things. I'm a volleyball coach. Did I play volleyball? No. All right. But I'm still coaching out there and I'm going to tell you why. Because each and every Thursday and Saturday and we're investing in these kids and we get to see them thrive and flourish in a fun environment. But I get to share the gospel with them. Each one of them hear the gospel. They hear biblical message, some encouragement, some prayer. And I'll tell you what kids need. They need community. They need people that are investing in them. And this is an opportunity. Hey, if you've got grandkids, you've got kids, uh, you've got neighbors out there, invite them. Uh, have them be a part. We got, uh, that's forming right now. Inside your life guide, there's actually a flyer for that. So you can take it home. Remember to sign up for that. But you know, we had an awesome event uh, just this last week. Holy Week was just, uh, it was tremendous. We serve a risen king and we were celebrating that on Eastern Good Friday. We were uh, here gathering so many great things. But during the week, one thing you may not know is that we hosted the largest student event that we have in many, many years. And it was called Nerf Night. And it was a blast. No pun intended. Take a look at this. church. Can we give a hand up for that? My, well, my name is David. I'm one of the student leaders here with the, with the youth uh, kids. I want to give a shout out real quick to our, two of our youth kids on stage with us. We got Ben over here and we got Michael. Can we give a hand to them right now? You know, we're, we are making an impact to our students, uh, whether it's doing these events like these where we can invite their friends out to come to us, right? Or on Wednesday nights when we meet 630 here on Wednesdays, they're hearing the name of Jesus they're getting what he's all about, right? And it's so important that we do that with the next generation of kids, right, church? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, want you, I want to invite you guys to stand back up as we get back into the time of worship. Let's hear it for these kids. You guys ready? Here we go. <laughs> Oh, hey. 
a seat. As you walked in, you should have received a communion element. If you did not, just raise your hand. Our ushers would love to come by and give you a communion element this morning. I love this past week, I've been reading in Psalms 145. And I just want to read a few of these verses to you as we connect to communion. It says this, the Lord is gracious and compassionate. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion in all that he has made. The Lord is trustworthy in all his promises and he is faithful in all he does. I don't know what questions you're walking through right now. I don't know what seasons of life you're walking through. I just, I think back to myself, even a couple years ago, a couple years ago, even like almost to the day, I had to step down from a job because I was struggling with depression. I was having significant panic attacks. I had anxiety that was overwhelming to me. And I had to stop and reflect and go, God, help me. And through a long process, I will just even just to come back today and go, man, God, I'm so grateful for your faithfulness, even in the darkest storms. I'm so grateful for your trustworthiness, even when I didn't fully understand all that was happening in my life. God, I, I praise you for your, for your goodness to me, your compassion to me. So again, I don't know what questions you're walking through or what seasons of life you're walking in right now. But I remind you that, that God is faithful, that God is good, that God is trustworthy this morning. And so we stop to take communion because it's so easy in life just to keep going by every moment and moment and actually kind of forget sometimes that God is good, that God is trustworthy, that he is faithful. And that's what we're doing with the communion this morning. We want to stop and pause and reflect on where do you see God's goodness? Where do you see God's faithfulness in your life? And to say thank you. When Jesus gathered his disciples together on the, on the last supper to kind of institute communion for us, he did it because he knew we would just forget we would get busy with our lives and we would forget sometimes about God's goodness and faithfulness. And so we stop and pause this morning. And so I encourage you as you take your bread, open it up. And before you take it, just take a moment in your, in your heart and tell God that something that you're grateful or thankful for that he's doing in your life right now. God, we take this bread because we know it's your body broken on the cross for us. And we're grateful for your faithfulness and goodness in our lives. God, we take this right now together. And as you open up the juice, just in your heart, tell God, thank you for how much he loves you so much that he was willing to send Jesus to die on the cross for you, for your sins. And so we take, just take a moment, just a few seconds, just tell God, thank you for how much he loves you in your heart. God, we take this juice as a symbol of your blood shed for us on the cross together. As we sing this next song, I just remind you that idea that God is faithful, that God is trustworthy. And so as we sing, Jesus paid it all to know that that's true, that he has paid for all our sins. I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray 
find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all to say my lips shall still repeat Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow sin had left a Church family, we have a special day today, and I want to call up here our board chairman, Tom Hall, and I want to call up here all of our elders who are uh, currently serving as an elder or... I want to call up here Brian Logue as well. And this will be the last time that we call Brian Logue our worship arts minister and today we get the opportunity of calling him Pastor Brian I just want to say a few words about ordination ordination is when a church family and the representatives of that church family the leaders are stepping behind a candidate who has pursued a process to ensure that his character and his competencies and that he is able to execute faithfully the office of being a pastor. And so, Tom, would you step forward and just remind us of, yeah, you could use that right there. Thank you, sir. Would you step up here? Sure. Yep. Uh, And just remind us of what our process is and what this means. Well, first of all, I congratulate you and he was uh, thinking of titles I could call him before the service and one of them was your eminence but I don't know how to spell that so. but, uh, but this is an important day for our, for our church uh, where we officially uh, ordain him as a, as a pastor and it's not a, it's not a light thing it's not something we do flippantly he, uh, he, there is a, a deliberate process that uh, he's gone through, that we've gone through to uh, get to this day. It started with God calling him and the Holy Spirit gifting him to be, to be a pastor. And then on his part, he's uh, uh, gotten education, he's, uh, he's studied, he's, uh, he's worked hard to, uh, to get to this day. And so recently, we uh, convened a, an ordination council uh, headed by uh, our uh, NorCal area minister. Uh, and he's standing right there actually <laughs> sitting, and I can't believe he's here because he just recently had back surgery. Thank you for being here, my friend. Yes. That's right. That's right. And do, you want, do you want to come up here, or are you more comfortable there? I do want you up here. I can bring this mic down to yes. you, too. This is Kent Carlson. He's our area minister. Yeah. And so, uh, so, so Kent, um, he chaired this ordination council. It was made up of other pastors in NorCal as well as the uh, pastors and elders of this church. And, uh, and uh, they uh, uh, very rigorously uh, <laughs> quizzed him, uh, examined him for his, his faith in Christ, his, his knowledge of Scripture, and his fitness to be uh, to be called pastor, and I'm happy to say 
that he was unanimously uh, uh, approved for yeah. being ordained. Amen. And so uh, today, the uh, elders will be uh, laying hands on him, elder pastors, and uh, we will be uh, uh, acknowledging and uh, that that uh, God has called him uh, to be a pastor and minister of the word. Praise God so, for yeah, that. That's good. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Brian, I first want to say thank you for being my friend. Can we stand closer? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Thank you for partnering in ministry. One of the things I appreciate about you most, man, is your humility. Thank you. Your teachability. Continue that. Thank you. We thank you uh, as well for uh, preaching the word, being part of our preaching team. When I was just thinking about this ceremony and um, this opportunity, uh, God laid on my heart 2 Timothy. And this is the words Paul, the Apostle Paul, is giving to his protege, Timothy. And as you remember in the first chapter, he says, fan into flame the gift that you received when they laid their hands on them. Then he goes throughout the letter to uh, just remind him about how he executes faithfully the office of being a pastor. But this one particularly jumped out to me. He said, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have been convinced of because you know those from whom you've learned it, God's word. But how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures. And I believe you told our ordination council that you accepted Christ in the bathtub at the age of three yeah. or something like that. Yeah. And how your family just raised you up in the faith. And what a beautiful gift that is. Because here's why. These are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Because all scripture is God breathed. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the servant, the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And here's what I want to do. I want to charge you, just as the Apostle Paul charged Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Yes. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. We have full faith you're going to do that, brother. Thank you. So let's uh, lay hands on him. We're going to say a prayer, and then I do have a gift for you, but we're going to commission you. Father God, we stand before you humbly, but with great joy, knowing that you equip your church. Lord, you equipped us with Jesus Christ, who is the foundation. You equipped us with your word that gives us life and breath and salvation, Lord, and we cling to it, Lord. But you call specific individuals to be part of a team, Lord, that preaches and that communicates and teaches and strengthens your body. And we recognize that Brian has this gift. Lord, we also recognize that you are appointing him simultaneously to the office of elder. And so what an exciting day this is for him and for his ministry, for his family. Lord, thank you for his faithfulness. Lord, I pray that this day would just fan into flame the gift that you have given him. Lord, and uh, we would all acknowledge and, and just sit under Brian as one of our teachers as he communicates faithfully this word. So we pray that you would go before you. Would you commission him? Would you consecrate him with your Holy Spirit? God, we thank you for calling this man. And we all pray in Jesus' Jesus name. name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 My wife. That's my wife right there. You can take a seat. I just want to embarrass Brian for a moment. <laughs> First, I just want to, uh, honestly, with all sincerity, just give you a certificate of ordination, oh, man. Thank you. Uh, That's great. But um, I also know that oftentimes you come up here with a little puny Bible, and uh, <laughs> if you're going to be, if you're going to be preaching, you know, I just thought, thought maybe you, you need like a real Bible. I need a real all Bible. Right. <laughs> so. We got you that. Just there's some notes Thank in there you. for you, man. So, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> got it. But also, this is for all the congregation for them to just beware because that says, Pastor, warning. Anything you say or do can be used in a sermon. Okay. So you can wear that now with pride. 
just wear this around the house, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My poor kids. Thank you, Brian. Well, thank you so God bless, much. Brother. Let's roll the intro. Good morning again. Good morning. My name is Pastor Brian. I am a... Oh, thanks. Stop it. Okay. Go on. Okay. Part of the teaching team here, and I'm so grateful to be able to share the word with you today. We're kicking off a new message series called Questions for God. Questions for for God. And if you joined us last week at Easter service for the first time, let me extend to you a, a heartfelt welcome on your return. I'm glad you're here. And our message series really is going to be unpacking these difficult questions that we have for God. Maybe you've been exploring what it means to be a Christian or a believer, but you still have some nagging questions that are, that are preventing you from taking that step of committing your life to Christ. Hopefully over the next eight weeks, we will be able to answer some of these questions for you and help you move from exploring the faith into committing your life to Christ. And if you've been a believer for a long time, hopefully this message series will equip you with some answers that you may receive. As somebody knows that you're a Christian, they know you go to church, and then they corner you at the grocery store with a really difficult question Uh, Hopefully this message series will help you and equip you with some answers to some tough questions. And let's put the phone number up there. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be collecting your questions. You can text your question to that phone number, and we'll be logging all of them and keeping track of them. And then on the second half of this series, we're going to shift to being a little bit more topical and answering these questions that you yourself are sending in. And if we have a ton of questions, we might even do a a Facebook Live where we hop on the internet and we answer all of your questions. It's going to be an exciting and challenging and wonderful journey, and I hope that you will commit to the long haul on this one, that from week to week we wrestle with these questions. So today's question is, God, why don't you answer my prayers? God, why don't you answer my prayers? We pray, and we come before the Lord, and we pour out our heart, and we oftentimes attach big emotions to these prayers. Why don't you heal? God, why don't you deliver? God, why don't you save? God, why don't you give me an answer? And then it feels like all that we're hearing in return is quietness and silence from God. It's a big question. Why aren't you answering my prayer? So right at the top of this morning, let me say it this way. The big idea is this. Prayer is not cause and effect. Prayer is a conversation. If you take nothing else away from today, let it be this. Prayer is not about cause and effect. Prayer is about a conversation with the living God. Prayer is not about asking God to do a thing and then hoping that he does the thing because then we get frustrated in the silence. We feel like as the old joke is, you know, when you ask a man to do something, he's going to do it. You don't need to remind him every six months. All the women are nodding their head. (laughs) We feel that way with God. God, I keep asking you to do this thing and you don't do it. I feel like you should do it, but you're not doing it. Why aren't you doing? Why aren't you answering my prayer? 
Turn with me, if you will, to Habakkuk chapter 1. Habakkuk chapter 1. It's in the Old Testament, about halfway through your Bible somewhere. I'd give you a page number, but I don't know what Bible you're reading. So just thumb through until you find Habakkuk chapter 1. And a little backstory on what's going on here. Habakkuk is a prophet of God, which means he's in conversation with God. He's talking with God. He's crying out on behalf of Judah, the southern kingdom of God's people. And they've got this king, Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim is not a good king. He's been put into power by the pharaoh of Egypt so that he can tax the people of Judah and send the money to Egypt. And on top of that, there's violence and discord throughout his whole nation. So Habakkuk is coming to God with this prayer. And this book of Habakkuk, it's, it's short, but it's this back and forth conversation between Habakkuk and God. We see what Habakkuk says, and then we see God's response. And I think the best way to bring chapter 1, verses 1 through 11 to life is to try and act it out for you a little bit. I'm going to try and do a little acting here. So when I'm standing here... God's voice. When I'm standing here, Habakkuk's voice. God, Habakkuk. All right. Okay, here we go. Let's act this out. Habakkuk starts. How long, Lord, must I call out for help, but you do not listen? Or I cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate long doing? God. Yeah, that that sounds pretty bad. That sounds pretty bad. Yeah. I'm bothered, Lord. Destruction and violence are before me. There's strife and conflict. It abounds, and therefore the law is paralyzed, and justice, it never prevails. Yeah, Habakkuk, that that sounds terrible. That sounds terrible. You have no idea, Lord. Listen, the wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. What are you going to do about it? God, when are you going to fix this? Look at the nations and watch Habakkuk and be utterly amazed. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Let's go. For I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. That's what I'm talking about. Miracle after miracle, another one is on the way. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth and seize dwellings that are not their own. What? No, wait, wait, hear me out, hear me out. They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a lot of themselves, and they promote their own honor. Okay, God, that sounds terrible and like the exact opposite of what I was asking for. I know, I know, listen. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than the wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gallops headlong their horsemen come from afar they they fly in like an eagle swooping to devour and they come intent on violence violence that's what i was asking you to stop in our nation and you're bringing violence yeah yeah their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand god i was just suggesting that you like get our king jehoiakim to just like Make peace or something. (laughs) These Babylonians, they mock kings and they scoff at rulers. They laugh at all fortified cities. By building earthen ramps, they capture the cities. Then they sweep past like the wind and they go on. They're a guilty people. Their strength is their own God. Okay. And scene. (laughs) Thank you. What we have here is Habakkuk praying to God and he's asking God for peace. He is asking God to come in and like bring peace to the situation. And then it seems like God's answer does come and God's answer is like the exact opposite of what Habakkuk was praying for. 
And so then we've got to ask ourselves, like, well, then why even pray? Why even bring this up before God if the answer is even going to be seemingly worse than what we're asking for? If Habakkuk is just asking for peace, and now an invading army is coming, what is going on? To this morning, this morning we are going to shift our thinking about what prayer is. Prayer is not cause and effect. Prayer is a conversation with God. So let me start with this, what prayer is not. Prayer is not incantation or divination. Prayer is not an incantation or a divination. Incantation is a series of words said as a magic spell to achieve a desired effect. Prayer is not that. Prayer is not divination. Divination is the practice of seeking knowledge of the future or the unknown from some supernatural force. Prayer is not that either. Prayer is not either of those things. So I've got some good news and some bad news for you today. What would you like first? Good news or bad news? You want the bad news first? All right, I'll give you the bad news first. Bad news first. The bad news is this. Prayer doesn't work. Prayer doesn't do anything. Right now, the board of elders are like, boy, the paint ain't even dry yet, and you already said something dumb. (laughs) Prayer doesn't work. Prayer doesn't do anything. Prayer doesn't work. Prayer doesn't work. It is God who works. See, I'm a child of the 80s. I grew up with Star Wars. Star Wars and Pee Wee Herman. So now it all makes sense. But I grew up with, I grew up with Star Wars, and I think sometimes we come to prayer feeling like it's some sort of Star Wars force. Like... We start out, we speak California, hey, bro, can I pray for you? And then they say, yeah. And then we turn King James and we go, Lord, uh, by thine bounty of thine heavens, will you rend down? Healing on my brother, heal his pinky finger, Lord. Begin to... Strong the forces with this one. We have this idea of prayer where it's like, If I just, the right words, and enough energy and effort, I can, my prayer can, prayer doesn't work. This is the good news. It's God who works. It is God who heals. It is God who saves. It is God who restores our bodies. It is God that brings the financial freedom that we need. It is God who rescues us from the pit. It is God who frees us from the snare of death. It is God who gives us the promise of eternal life. It is God who raised his son from the grave as we celebrated last Sunday. And it is God who says we get to rise from the grave also. That's the good news, and that's what prayer is. So write this down. Prayer is expressing our understanding, our will, and our emotions to God. Prayer is also aligning our heart and soul and mind and strength with the will of God. We get to express how we feel. We get to say, God, this is what I'm wrestling with. This is what I'm struggling with. God, this is what, this is, and then we begin to align our heart and our mind and our soul with the will of God in that. Let's put up that first diagram there. This is what our prayers often look like. We go, God, here's my problem. Here's my problem. And I'll I'll tell you what, God, even as I'm praying to you, I'm going to toss in my plan. This is what I think would be a good outcome. And then, oh, God, if it's your will, we tag that on at the end. If it's your will, Lord, here's my problem and my plan. And then your will, your plan. And our prayers then should begin to shift and start to look like this next graphic that says, I pray God's plan, and then I pray God's plan, 
And then I pray God's plan. And I begin to align myself with what God is doing. And though I'm expressing my heart and my desires and my sorrows and my fears and my hopes and my dreams, I'm praying that God, through this conversation that we're having, you will begin to align my awareness, my perception, my understanding, and my actions in line with your plan. Help me to see the bigger thing that you're doing. Recently, I cleaned my daughter's fish tank. She has a, a betta fish named Mooney, and I couldn't bring the aquarium here to show you, so instead I brought this. <laughs> she has a betta fish named Mooney. And I go into her bedroom, and I... Water's murky and there's algae growing on the, the glass and the pH is off and the ammonia levels are bad and it's just unhealthy for Mooney. So we get in there and we take out the fake seaweed and we give that a good scrub and then take out about, you know, a quarter of the water and, and then get in there with a toothbrush and start scrubbing the walls to get all that algae off and, and rustle up the, the rocks a little bit to get the murk out and then kind of suction that out and then add new, clean, fresh, treated water on the top. And now Mooney's got a, a healthy, fresh fish tank to live in. Here's the problem. For Mooney, the giant hand comes down <laughs> and takes out Mooney's favorite seaweed, and it disappears, and it's gone. And then scoops of water start coming out, and Mooney is like, what? Uh, what is happening? Giant hand, why are you doing this to me? And then the, the toothbrush comes in and starts scrubbing the walls and Mooney hides under his little favorite rock while the, the scrubbing is happening. And then the, 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 the fake plant comes back in and then this torrent, this tidal wave of water comes splashing down and fills his tank back up. And from Mooney's perspective, this whole process makes him fear for his life. He wonders if his little fishy life is over, if he's going to be sushi. <laughs> from the fish's perspective, from Mooney's perspective, it can seem terrible. But God is doing a thing. And just like with Habakkuk, God is cleaning house. God is bringing in the Babylonians to clean house. And it looks terrible. And it looks frightening. And yet God is up to something. So as we pray, write this down, point one. When I pray, I should turn my wanting into waiting. I should turn my wanting into waiting. Habakkuk. Chapter 1, verse 2 says, How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Habakkuk is crying out, How long, Lord? How long? He's positioning himself with this petition and this concern, and we do the same thing. We bring our wants, our desires to God because we don't know how else to understand it. We don't know how else to make sense of it. I mean, we only see the world from the two little eyeballs embedded in the top of our, our bodies. This is how we see the world. We can't see it. I can't even see the world from your perspective. I can't even see the world from your eyes, let alone from God's perspective. I can't see it. But it's okay to bring our petitions, our hurts, our wants, our desires to God and go, God, this is how I understand it. This is the way I'm experiencing it. I am hurt and I'm tired and I am afraid. And I encourage you 
to shift this gift of like giving your wanting to God and shift your prayer to a season of waiting. As you're waiting on God to answer this prayer, as you're waiting on God to answer this prayer, let the yearning turn into just a patient waiting on God. Listen to what Philippians chapter 4 says. Paul's writing to the Philippian church, and he says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Bring it to the Lord. Bring it to him. Give him the desires. Give him the wanting. And then what happens next? It doesn't say that the answer comes immediately. It doesn't say that if you said the words correctly in the right order, God would do the thing. It doesn't say any of that. What it says is the peace of God will guard your heart. That's what the scripture says. Years ago, uh, back in like 2015, Allison and I, we'd had both of our babies. They were... They were littles, and my mom lives in Lincoln, and we were living out in Cordelia, Green Valley, which is out past Fairfield. If you're driving towards the Bay Area, you know where the Jelly Belly Factory is? We lived in the shadow of the Jelly Belly Factory. And we just started wanting to move closer to family. All of a sudden, we had our kids, and we're like, we are not satisfied any longer living an hour and a half away. We want to live close to grandma and cousins up in this area. And I would drive 45 minutes every Monday up to Woodland to have lunch with my mom, who would drive 45 minutes down from Lincoln so we could meet halfway, and my kids could see grandma. We just started praying, God, we want to live closer to grandma. God, make, it, make, the, make a way for us to live closer to grandma. And then I came up with this harebrained scheme. I was like, if we sell our house in Cordelia and we move to Woodland, then we're only 45 minutes away from grandma instead of an hour and a half. See, th- God, this is a perfect plan. I've got it all figured out, Lord. We sell our house, we move to Woodland. Just open the door, God. Open door. Here we go. Silence. For two years, Silence from God. And if I could go back and preach to myself, I would say, turn that wanting into waiting. Brian, chill out, bro, and just relax. God is doing a thing. It took two years for us to be able to move, and what God was doing was increasing our property value. We were able to sell low where we were, or sell high where we were, and buy low in Lincoln, and God provided and made a way. And as a matter of fact, I woke up this morning and looked at my memories, and this is what popped up seven years ago. Today we drove away from our house in Fairfield. Seven years ago today, God's timing is impeccable. And if I could go back in time, I would say, turn that wanting into waiting. You gave your request to the Lord. You petitioned God. At the time, I was frustrated. I felt stuck. I was wondering what God was doing. See, God is continually answering our prayers. God is in continual conversation with us. And what I didn't know at the time was God was doing a thing. I just was stuck in the wanting and was not resting in the waiting So point two is this, write this down. When I pray, I should. Look for the lesson, not the solution. When I pray, I should look for the lesson, not the solution. As I transform my prayers from giving my want to God to waiting on God, then I shift my prayers from problem solving to teaching moments. God, what are you teaching me? God, what are you showing me as I bring my requests and my petitions before you and you're giving me that peace? What are you teaching me? Habakkuk says it this way in verse three. He says, why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? 
Habakkuk's leaning into this and asking, why? Why, God, why? And as we shift our prayer from wanting to waiting, and as we're resting in the waiting and God is giving the peace, then we go, okay, give me the why, Lord. Give me the why. Because right now I have an angry why. Right now I have a frustrated why. But what are you teaching me? In Todd Hall's book, Reational Spirituality, there's this study that they did on what really produces spiritual transformation and life change. What really shifts us spiritually? And they were able to measure it in three things. Contemplative prayer, deep long-term relationships, and the last one you're not going to like, suffering. These three things begin to shift us into deep spiritual growth. And as we shift from wanting to waiting, and we're now sitting in the waiting, and we're looking away from the solution to just the lesson, God, what are you teaching me? The words of Romans chapter 8 come to mind. It says this, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray, for the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, for those he foreknew and predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. See, when we're praying, we might not even have the right words. We might not even be getting the prayer correct or right. We might be fumbling through it all, but God hears because his Holy Spirit, the actual living spirit of God is dwelling in your heart and speaking and interceding in you and through you and for you. So that we are conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. We get hung up on those words where it says, those he foreknew and those he predestined. And we stop there and we go, what does that mean? And we build these whole theologies around that. And then we, we forget that the most important part of that verse is right there at the end where it says, to be conformed to the image of his son. So that I'm being transformed into Jesusness, into the likeness of Christ. It's okay to ask the big why. God, why is this happening to me? Why? Why are you letting this go on and on? It's okay to ask the big why. If you're ready for the lesson. If you're ready for God to answer. So two weeks ago, not Easter Sunday, but the week before, Palm Sunday, I shared this briefly on Sunday morning. If you missed it, I'll give you a recap of the story. I threw out my back. On Saturday afternoon, I was here helping our worship leader, David, with some staging and lighting, getting everything prepped for Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, and I was supposed to be here to be his partner in that and to help him, and I, within the first 20 minutes, threw out my back. And people have asked, how's your back? I'm feeling so much better. Thank you for asking. People have also asked, how did you throw out your back? And it's a stupid story. I literally just stood up. I was seated. And I stood up, and my back froze up on me. Young people, this is what you have to look forward to. It's like, (laughs) it just, you injure yourself doing basic things. And then you start crackling and popping as you walk and making your own music. (laughs) I threw out my back just standing up, and within 20 minutes, I knew I was done. David had to drive my car around to the back doors and like hobble me out to the car and put me in my car, and he's like, hey, man, if, if, if you need me to lead worship in the morning, I can do it. He wasn't scheduled. He hadn't rehearsed. He hadn't practiced, but he was offering. I can do it if you need me. And I'm like, hey, this has happened a, a few times before, and I'm, within a few hours, I'm usually pretty good. I'll be fine in the morning. I can just get home and get to bed. So I went home, went to bed, woke up first thing Sunday morning, and I was like, I'm going to see a victory. And uh, I'm like, okay, here we go, Lord. Roll the feet off the bed and begin to stand up and, hallelujah. 
I was singing soprano. I was in just as much pain as I was in the night before. Like speak, speaking in those groans that words cannot express, fell back into bed and was like, I am in just as much pain as I was yesterday. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm supposed to lead worship and we've got the kids involved in the service and God, I prayed in your name. Jesus, heal me. Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I claim healing, and I'm still in pain. So I flop back in bed, and I just, I asked God the big why. My prayer shifted, and I said, okay, God, what are you teaching me? What are you teaching me right now? And this is what I heard the Lord speak to my heart. He said, Brian, you are not that important. Let David lead worship. Let Paul run the production team. And just get over yourself. And it might sound harsh that God spoke that to my heart, but let me tell you the tremendous amount of peace that began to wash over me going, we have got an incredibly talented team of people who seek after the heart of God. We've got an incredibly talented team that run all the computers and push all the buttons. Get over yourself. Let them do it. So I texted David. I said, David, I can't move. Can you lead worship? He texts back. It's 6.30 in the morning. He's, I got you, bro. He hopped in. He got it done. Throughout the course of the morning, I did start feeling better, more mobile, was able to move around. But what was the lesson? The solution I gave to God was heal my back. I got it all worked out. God's a perfect plan. You heal my back. I'm back in the game. God had a lesson for me. Let it go. Empower your team. Let others minister. Everything's going to be okay. By the way, you're not that important. Which brings us to point number three. When I pray, I should seek God's kingdom not my outcome. I should seek God's kingdom, not my outcome. This is how God answers Habakkuk's prayer. He says to Habakkuk, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed for I'm going to do something in your days that you would not even believe in if I told you I am raising up the Babylonians. What? What? God is up to some kingdom work here. They believed in their day that when an invading army came and took over a nation, that meant that the invading army's God is more powerful than the God of the nation that they just conquered. So what we read here is God is raising up the Babylonians to come and invade his own nation, which means in in the world, in the geopolitics happening at the time, God is actually going to lose face because this other country is coming in and taking them over. But God is up to some bigger kingdom work here. God is moving his pieces around the chessboard and God decides I'm gonna sacrifice my bishop so I can set up my checkmate. And sometimes God does that in our life. See, what we see here is that God is moving his pieces around the chessboard. And then we read in Daniel chapter 3 that the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, says after he watches Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire, if you're familiar with that story, the king actually says this, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then the next chapter, chapter 4 of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, after he regains his sanity, he says, then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is eternal. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. See, God is up to something. God allowed the nation of Judah to be taken into captivity so that the king of Babylon would begin praising the God Most High. So we look for the kingdom work of God. God, I submit my outcome to your kingdom. I submit my desires to your will. I look for the lesson, Lord. What are you teaching me? 
I had a sweet conversation with somebody in our church this last week that she cared for her husband with dementia. And it was a difficult, painful season of prayer, God praying for healing, praying for deliverance, asking the big why, why God, why? Until that disease ultimately led to the death of her husband and she found herself a widow. So I'm sitting with her and she says she has to go to work. And I say, well, oh, where, where do you work? And she goes, well, I work at the care facility for people with dementia. God had taught me and revealed to me that I can care for people who need to be cared for, who are dealing with this disease that I've already walked through. So now I'm caring for people with dementia. It's okay to bring our requests, our petitions to the Lord, our heartbreak to God and ask the big why. And I encourage you to open that circle just a little bit bigger and look for God's kingdom work. I'm not saying that God would send cancer or dementia or illness, but God can redeem it. God can take the brokenness of this world and turn it upside down for good. So in our last few moments together, let's apply this to our lives. And I've left these questions blank for you to wrestle with. These are the, your three questions here with three blanks. God, I'm sharing with you what is on my mind. And as I wait on you, you are teaching me. As I submit my desires to your kingdom work, God, I recognize that you are doing. That first one, what's the thing that is heavy on your heart? What's the burden that is weighing you down? Or maybe the prayer you've been praying for years. And this is not a one-minute prayer. This may be a one-week prayer or a one-month prayer or a one-year prayer, but I encourage you to begin praying through it. God, I give it over to you. This is what's on my heart. And as I wait on you, I trust you are teaching me. And as I seek you, Lord, I know that you are up to some kingdom work. God, we give this time over to you in the name of Jesus. By the Spirit that intercedes on our behalf, we bring, your, we bring our prayers before your throne. In the name of Jesus, we lift it up before you, God, and then we wait. And in the waiting, we are trusting, and in the trusting, we're learning, and in the learning, we are looking, and in the looking, we are seeing your kingdom at work. And we lift all this up in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. It was so, so good. Brian, thank you for bringing the word. And I was just thinking as he was sharing that photo up there of him seven years ago, how is it that Allison has not aged one day? And yet he's over here throwing out his back, right? Crackles, pop, or whatever he was saying. It's amazing. But you know, all of us have things we're wrestling with. We all have hardships we're walking through. And we go to God. We go to God in prayer. And he loves us. And he's there for us. We want to pray with you. We have a prayer team after the service. Love it to come alongside you and lift that up to our Heavenly Father. Next week, we want to invite you back as well. We're going to be still wrestling with some of these questions. The one next week is a biggie. In fact, it's the one that if confounded so many theologians through the years. It's this one. God, if you're so good, why is there so much bad in the world? We're going to dig into that and trust that God's word is going to lead us. And so we invite you back to come with us as we pray through that and think through that with his word. But today we are grateful that you're worshiping with us. There's a connection card there. You can fill out your prayer request on the back. 
Uh, we have a prayer team that prays over those each and every week. And if you're a guest, I invite you to take that connection card out to our new here table. We have a gift for you, just our way of saying thank you for worshiping with us. And you know, we're a church that is so, so generous, shirt off our back generosity. And we want to say thank you for the way you're investing and helping us reach this community for Christ in so many ways. And not just here, but abroad, all over the world. And uh, maybe you have heard, uh, we uh, put out this charge, this challenge to our congregation, if we could collectively all get engaged and we would be part of the Irresistible Initiative. And we celebrated just a few weeks ago that over $1.1 million has been committed or contributed to be a part of that. And what it's going to allow us to do is to continue to move forward in our family ministries. We're going to be unleashing, mentoring the wisdom of the ages on the next generation, upgrading this church campus. And we are going to be inspiring and strengthening your faith so you can live it out in this community. That's what we're going to be doing. But I want to tell you, 175 individuals have contributed to be part of that irresistible. So thank you for being part of it. You know, still opp opportunities to do that. Each week there's a, a little uh, envelope that we give out and you can pledge or you can write uh, your, your gift, your tithe there as well. And we have physical offerings you can give online, but we just want to uh, worship God through the giving our gifts. So I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward. They can receive the offering today. And you know, last week was Easter and what a celebration it was. It was so, so fun. Man, God moved so mightily through you. There was 125 people that rolled up their sleeves and served here on Easter. And you know what? We, praise God for that. You know what we were able to do? We were able to minister and share the gospel of Jesus Christ that he defeated death with over a thousand people. Over a thousand people were either physically here or joining us online on Easter. That's incredible. That's insane. So thank you. God is using you using us. Praise God for that. So let's watch this little highlight video of our Easter services. Awesome. Awesome. Just makes me hungry watching that video. So much great food. But by the way, if you are thirsty, we have a free coffee house today. They're specialty drinks. And so make sure you go grab one before you go out there. We're also going to be celebrating Brian. So we got some tasty treats out there. So when you head out there, make sure you stop and enjoy that as well. Would you stand with me, church family? And as you go, I want you to turn to your neighbor and you ask them, what is your favorite specialty drink or what is your favorite place to go to get that drink? God bless you as you go.